Praise the Lord. Amen. How y'all doing? Amen. You know, it's funny. We, we're sitting here. We got, you know, it's been two years since we've had one service. And we're just trying to figure out, like, what did we do before? Who goes up first? <laughs> we're trying to figure this out, you know. But, um, man, it's great. It's great to be back in one service. Amen. Uh, amen. It is. I do like sleeping in. <laughs> I do like sleeping in, but unfortunately, the pastor has got to be here. But uh, it's good to see everyone. Uh, praise God. Thank you for all for uh, coming. Um, our scripture reading is Psalms 112, and that is on page 415 in the Pew Bible. Psalms 112. And the scripture reads, Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on the earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. The good man deals graciously and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he will never be shaken. The righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. He will not be afraid of evil, evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He will not be afraid until he sees his desires upon his enemies. He has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn will be exalted with honor. The wicked will see it and be grieved. He will gnash his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we look to you this morning with grateful hearts. We thank you for how you oversee all of our affairs. Thank you for providing all that we need that pertains to life and godliness. We even thank you for the desire, but through our own will, we decided to attend fellowship here today. It's been a long road through many challenges that we faced because of this pandemic, but you've guided us <clears throat> to two services, and yet we are back here together in one service to fellowship, to learn, to grow, and to honor you. Thank you for carrying us through those challenges. We thank you for Steve and Valerie Norby, Lord, and we pray for the outreach activities that they do would be very effective and that hearts would be affected and people would be changed and they would see their sin, we see the holiness and the sacrifice of Christ. We continue to pray for their spiritual growth and for the staff and the students who have been continually faithful to all of the meetings that they've had. But we also pray that you continually bless them financially to continue to spread the gospel, to continue to be your hands and your feet amongst the people that need to hear truth. Father, as we hear your word and partake of communion today, Lord, may your Holy Spirit cause us to reflect on your punishment and death for the sins of all humanity and your resurrection to life to give us eternal life. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. I'm in. Thank you for reminding me of my place. I'm going after you today. Let's <laughs> all set ready to bump at each other there. May 1st. Good day. Um, amen. And uh, not only uh, are we, I'm glad to hear you all singing together for the first time in two years, but also uh, we will be coming to you, as we have for a couple months now, with the, uh, with the uh, communion coming to you. There's still the opportunity, though, if you want uh, to get uh, one of the little self-contained cups. We have them in the back, but you have to go back and get them. 
Uh, also, offering, we'll be coming to you because we want to make that a part of worship again. And you can still, if you prefer, either before or after the service, drop your offering into the plate. But we will be coming to you. If you've already put it in, that comes by, it doesn't mean you have to give again. <laughs> but we will be coming to you. So it is May 1st. We're going to do that in a minute, but we are going to do that. It is May 1st. Some refer to it as May Day. Also, May Day is a call for rescue. And when I go out teaching, we have to break up. I don't do this for my preaching so much, but when we're teaching all day long, we show some videos or do some things to lighten it up a little bit. One of the things is a video, a very short video. It's called the German Coast Guard. So a young Coast Guard guy is put in front of a microphone. They leave the, the other guys leave the room. And suddenly a call comes in from a British ship that's in trouble. Mayday, Mayday, we are sinking, we are sinking, Mayday. And the guy goes on, hello, this is the German Coast Guard? Yes, yes, we are sinking, what are you sinking? And then the response of the guy is, okay, what are you sinking about? <laughs> and we get a laugh. We had a German guy in class one time who spoke German, I was really getting nervous, but he left, so we were good. <laughs> the other thing we're going to start doing again today, we've done a couple times in the past couple years, but not a lot, is welcoming first time visitors with a gift. So all we ask you to do, we're not going to, you don't have to get up, give a speech or anything. Our elders are ready to give them to. If you're here for the first time this morning, first time this Sunday morning, we want to put that gift in your hand. All you need to do is raise your hand, and we'll get that gift to you. We have some folks here for the first time that are brave enough to put your hands up. Yeah, a couple up here on the side. They'll come to you. Just keep them up a minute. And if um, if the kids are here for the first time too, we got some stuff for the kids back there too, which we can get now. We get that later. Well, welcome everybody. Glad to have you here. And uh, a couple things to mention to you. Um, the ladies are still planning that mother-daughter tea on May 7th. It's not too late to register, but today is the deadline. Get your registration slip and the money in today. Uh, Thursday is the National Day of Prayer. We have a lot of things to pray about. But there's a blue insert. You can see there's a couple locations. The top one is Rose Tree Media at 1130. Uh, but also there's something at noon at Media, Media Courthouse, and 6.30 at night at Spruce Street Baptist Church. Not that you have to come to one I'm going to, but I will be participating in front of the Media Courthouse at noon on Thursday, praying for a particular topic. So there's the information if you want to go, you can go out and uh, just get there yourself. Um, GP Kids has uh, their carnival night coming up. Always a lot of fun. It's on May 11th. Uh, we need some people to help out, to run the carnival booths and face paint. There's certain people here, though, I would not put in charge of painting faces. <laughs> I'm not going to say who it is. But we need people to face paint, hand out food, distribute prizes and some other things. If you think it can help that night, it will be a real time. It's kind of gearing up the end of the year, but also a celebration of God taking us through a year of TV kids. If you can help, see Pat Burns today if you can. That would be really appreciated. Um, I'm feeling pretty good because I got sleep before and after the event, but I did pick up Jason and Maris. They were delayed in Chicago coming back from San Diego, so I picked them up at 3 a.m. It was good to see them at 3 a.m. <laughs> it was fine. And they're very excited about how God was working through their time there. But I tell you that, you know, they were working with getting new people from Ukraine settled, but they have agreed to come and speak at our harvesters on Thursday, May 19th at noon. That's a luncheon. I'm opening it up to anybody that might want to hear from them. So, cover this luncheon to you know, bring your own and we'll share it with others, but uh, they're not supposed to be um, deployed again until June. That'll be a longer deployment, so we can get them in here. And so that's, I'll advertise it some more, but right now, Harvester's Lunch on Thursday, May 19th is when they're coming in. So, as I said, we're going back to uh, taking an offering. This is exciting. I don't know why it feels exciting, but to see these guys come up and pick up the plates and come to you is just maybe a little bit more sense of a normalcy. Amen? You seem very excited about it. That's all right. You don't have to. We'll come up here. We will have prayer and they'll come to the offering. We'll have the special music right after that. Let's pray together. Father, we've come to you a couple times already today. We come again. We thank you for the provision. The giving in the past two years was amazing. Even though we went to 
putting stuff in uh, up front or mailing it in or different things, Venmo. Lord, you provide for all our needs. And now as we head into a new phase, a new season of the church, we ask you to continue to prompt your people to give an act of worship and to meet the needs of this local church. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
release your heavy burden and let everything that has breath praise the Lord because this is why we have breath to praise this is why we have seen the movie Castaway. She the movie characters Tom Hanks plays the character and he's stuck on a desert island for years. Some of you may have felt like you been stuck on a desert island for years through the pandemic. But in his case he comes back, finds out life has changed dramatically since he's been away. And he tries to re-engage with some things, uh, his fiance others, and just things are so different. And so, toward the end of the movie, he's at crossroads. There's a road going this way and a crossroad going this way. And he's just standing there. And he turns and looks each way. And, you know, some, if you watch the movie, some of you are thinking he wants to go down that road, go meet that lady that he just saw. But you don't know, because he's looking way ahead and just thinking. That's kind of where we are today. As a church, you know, looking down that way, looking down that way. Which way should we go? What should we do? Who should we be as a people? And we might try to look too far ahead because we don't know what the future holds. But we have something. We have a lamp onto our feet. We have the Word of God. Amen. We have the ability to talk about it and pray together. And so when you hold a lamp, I thought about lighting this. I thought, I thought better of it. <laughs> so pretend in your mind it's lit. And if you hold the lamp out, you know this. It shows you what's next what the next step is. And then you take that step and you see the next step. Our leadership, support, supported by many of you, have done that and decided it's time to go back to one service. Do we know what's beyond that? We have some thoughts. But now that we're here, we'll look to the next step and the next step and see where God leads us. And he will lead us together, won't he? Amen. Won't be just the leaders, because I'll tell you what, if we just take those steps, it's going to get really lonely out here if nobody from the church is following. But we want to go together. We're a congregational church. We're led by the Spirit. We're led by the Word of God. Amen. And so we're going to follow His lead. And like I said, we felt that this was the time for us to gather again. We'll continue to live stream the services uh, for those that feel that they can't be here yet. But we want to gather together. We need to be together. That will come out in some of the things we're talking about today. That verse that I alluded to, Psalm 119, 105, says... Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. We're going to talk about an entire psalm today, Psalm 112. And the book of Psalms is about real life in a real world. And has two dimensions, I want you to think about. It has a horizontal dimension. That is, it talks about our relationships that we have here on earth. But at the same time, we're trying to figure out things here on earth. It gives us a vertical dimension. Living out our faith. Living out our relationship with the Lord, with other people at the same time. So we get to understand that there's pain in this world. But at the same time as the people of God, we experience the joy of the Lord, don't we? Amen. Which goes beyond that pain. And we learn to be dependent on God even though things are difficult. See, I believe this is why even today, Christians are drawn to the book of Psalms during difficult times. Psalm 111, right before the psalm that we're looking at today, focuses on the very character of God. It reminds people to put the Lord first, to trust Him to meet every single need. And then Psalm 12, which we'll look at today, talks about the blessings of fearing the Lord and obeying His Word. The psalm talks about we don't have to fear bad news. 
We don't have to fear the enemy. But the psalm leads us to something. It leads us to praise the Lord and worship. I'm glad we're worshiping together. To stand in awe of the Lord, who He is and what He does. To delight in the fellowship of the Lord, being together with Him and with others. And to seek to obey Him. Psalm 112 is called a wisdom psalm, part of the wisdom literature. It has that blessed is the man formula. And it begins in verse 1 by reminding, reminding us the blessedness of, well, delighting in wisdom. I mean, we're going to walk through this together. So if you have your Bibles and you want to look at it at the same time, we're in Psalm 112. Verse 1 first. It says, Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. I'm sure many of you have either read or watched the films on the Chronicles of Narnia. In one of the stories, in this allegory by C.S. Lewis, two girls, Susan and Lucy, are getting ready to meet Aslan, Aslan, excuse me, Aslan the lion, who represents Christ. They're talking to two animal creatures, Mr. and Mrs. Eve. Okay, and so they're preparing to meet him, Aslan. And oh, says Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, said Mrs. Beaver. And make no mistake, if there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, you're either braver than most or else just silly. Then Lucy speaks up. Then, it isn't, then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mrs. Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. That's the attitude when we come before the Lord. We, you don't really want to save God. God kind of sits back and does anything. He's God of the universe. Amen. He's a God who loves you. Amen. And this psalm begins almost taking it for granted that we understand worldly fear. Some of the fear is good. We teach it to our children. There's dangers if you cross the street and don't look both ways. That Watch out for sharp objects. Stranger danger. All those things we try to instill in children so they will be safe. But this psalm is talking about fears, fears that can paralyze us, make life miserable because we're too afraid to do anything. I believe some of these fears were experienced by many people during the pandemic. And I'm not sure they're automatically coming away from those fears. Because to overcome those fears, those and others, you need to cultivate a right relationship with the Lord to, I'll be talking about this, to fear Him, to learn His will from His Word, to obey Him. This becomes really the source of our blessing in life. Now, friends, if you're struggling, if you know people are struggling spiritually after they're going through the last couple of years or mental health issues, even out in the world, they're talking about a mental health crisis. Even if you feel that your social well-being, that you're struggling, Psalm 112 is a response to your distress call. Because it goes on in the next two verses, talking about... The blessings, the blessings of righteousness. Look what it says. His descendants will be mighty on the earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. We see in these verses this trusting in the wisdom of God, the information he gives to us to help us establish really personal righteousness. Now, I need to make sure you understand that the fruits of righteousness are given to us in Old Testament terms. This idea of generational blessing and riches and honor and the eternal legacy that it endures forever. That under the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Covenant, material wealth was understood to be evidence of God's blessing. But the New Testament takes it further in the progress of Revelation. That we then use whatever God gives us, even wealth, to bless others. That is the greater sign of righteousness. Not just about being blessed, but seeking to bless others. Amen? Amen. Makes sense? Okay. This is why we have to put out a spiritual distress call at May Day. Because it's not just about us. It's not just about what's happening to you. It's about passing the blessing on to others. And sometimes this blessing comes at the darkest of times, the most difficult times. And that's God's intentions, that we learn that even in the midst of adversity, difficult times, we can be a blessing. Look what he says in verse 4, moving down Psalm 112. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. 
is gracious. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. Now you know and I know that light and darkness is, is a major theme in the Bible. It starts in Genesis 1. But it continues through to finding its full realization in Jesus Christ, the light of the world. So on a personal level, think about it. Our own salvation, coming to faith in Christ, is the light of Christ shining in our darkness, whatever that might have been. Amen? Amen. He gives light. He gives assurance. He gives peace. And we experience that grace, that compassion, that righteousness of God. But it may or may not change our circumstances. But it will change us. Amen? Amen. It always changes us. And helps us to see our life situations differently. That leads us to this idea of being blessings of being gracious and compassionate to others. Look at verse 5, if you're following along. It says, A good man deals graciously and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. So, it's not just, and he is, by the way, he's not just that God is gracious and compassionate to us. He gives us, as believers in Jesus Christ, those same character qualities. Same thing as we look to deal with others. And it says a good man. But it really means man, woman, or child. A good person. A person of quality. A person of good Christian character. That he deals with people. That you and I deal with people with grace. Which is undeserved favor. We don't, we're not just nice to people who are nice to us. Sometimes we're nice to people who aren't very nice to us. That boss. That co-worker. That fellow student. That student. But you give them undeserved favor. You show them the heart of God by showing them grace. And then it says God makes you a person of discretion. It would be really easy to just run right past that. But let me talk about what discretion is. I like this quote, really basic quote by President Calvin Coolidge. I have never been hurt by anything I didn't say. Listen, I've never been hurt by anything I didn't say. So that brings us to the uh, definition of discretion. Listen to this. Discretion is the quality of behaving or speaking in such a way as to avoid causing offense or revealing private information. Mm. You know, if I knew people, people like this, I would trust them. I would talk to them. If I knew I would, they would not talk to me in an abusive way and they would not reveal private information, I would trust them with information. The psalm tells us that uh, it's a spiritual issue. See, I know, I'm not talking to anybody in here, I have nobody in mind, but I know Christians who lack discretion, who decide to either talk to you in a certain way that's not pleasing, or they reveal information that you've told them, a bit of a gossip. It is a spiritual issue. And the psalm tells us that the person who is gracious and compassionate and understands discretion will be a blessing to others, even in hard times. You get that? You show that grace, you show that compassion, and you're discreet, you're being discreet about how you talk to them, what you reveal about them, you'll be a blessing to others. Even again, in those hard times, here's a longer section, kind of all goes together, verses 6 to 8, says this. This is talking about the person who is in that blessed position, who is, uh, fears the Lord. Verse 6 says, surely he will never be shaken. The righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. He will not be afraid of evil tidings or bad news. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He will not be afraid until he sees his desire upon his enemies. I think in this, verse 7 is the key. This good, this godly person, this person of wisdom, will not be afraid of evil or bad news. Don't be anxious about it. Oh no, what now? It's very important. It says, his heart, her heart, their hearts are steadfast. Why is that? Why are they steadfast? Because they trust in the Lord. Yeah, you know, I've met a lot of Christians who seem really okay when things are going well. But the true test of character is who, who are you during the tough times? They reveal the true character of a person. And verse 6 says, the righteous will never be shaken. Now, this is not to say that we are not occasionally taken aback by surprises that come to our lives. Maybe not so good ones. Sickness and death or others that, that, that grieve us. It's not that we're not taken aback, but our faith holds fast. Even in the midst of the tough times. It's the 
Hebrews 6.19 faith, that, that anchor of the soul, that the storms rage, my anchor holds. The anchor holds, because you're trusting in somebody beside yourself. The anchor who's Christ that gets you through those things. Amen? Amen. And that's a little stuffy in here, so stay with me. This is important. This is almost like a, a relaunch. Now I use an anchor, I'll say relaunch. Don't pull up your anchor. But we're heading out together to see where God's going to take us. And I'm excited about that. So Psalm 112 then declares, there's this blessing of righteousness. Now in verse 9, look at the words. He has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn, his horn will be exalted with honor. See, what this is now, verse 9, it's kind of a restatement of the whole theme of Psalm 112. It's setting us up for his final statement. So it says that honor and blessing, which I hope we all seek, the honor and blessing comes from being a person of generosity and compassion, of being someone who, someone who reflects the very righteousness of God, shows forth from your heart who God is, and of being known for your discretion, a person that keeps your word, your person that doesn't... Uh, Talk about other people behind their backs. It says, we are, if we're that, verse 9 says a very interesting thing. Your horn will be exalted with honor. What does that mean? The horn, the word horn is corno. The word is a symbol of dignity. It's about your reputation. Your reputation before others. It says, your life will be symbolized or be lived out in peace, even prosperity, God-given success rather than what the world has to show, that competitive, that greedy aspirations of the wicked. And that's the comparison being made between verses 9 and 10. You have people all around you that have described what's in verse 10. We'll talk about that too. So this is where the language really changes from the idea of being a blessing to people who are more of a cursing. This is the longings of the wicked. Look at verse 10. It says, The wicked will see it and be grieved, he will gnash his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. Amen. What are they going to see and grieve? They're going to see you. They're going to see you living out your faith. And they're going to be grieved in, in that you're walking around, talking about the Lord. They're seeing how you're blessed. And, and Jesus told us this would happen. He told us in Mark 13, 13, And you'll be hated by all for my name's sake. And why? They're jealous of how things are going for you. Why do they desire to be blessed? Why, why is it going well for them? So someone told me, it's clear, they're jealous about your blessings. And look at the expressions of what happens. Gnashing of teeth. We usually see that talking about someone who's already been sent to hell. Mm -hmm. The place of gnashing of teeth and melting away. These are terms of judgment. So this is what I believe. That a life lived for Christ, when you're living it out, it's a powerful tool that can be used by the Holy Spirit to convince them that they are accountable to God. You are a walking gospel. You're the walking good news. That there's a way for them to escape. There's a way for them to turn aside from those things that uh, can be so damaging. So your life, hopefully, is a testimony to God. Amen? Amen. Amen. I want that to be that. Ready to, rather than what the world is. So we're coming to communion today. We have an open communion. You don't have to be a member of the church to participate. But it doesn't mean anything if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ. So I would settle that. So recognize that Jesus said, I am the Son of God, come to live on earth, represented by the bread. I sacrificed my life on the cross to pay the debt for your sins. If you believe that, if you trust in Christ, place your faith in Christ, you become a member of the family of God. And then when you take the symbols, because communion itself doesn't do anything for you, it just reminds you of what Christ has done in living his perfect life as a son of God and sacrificing himself for you and offering you the free gift of eternal life. You know, I'm afraid that some Christians have decided over the past few years, I don't really need church. I don't need it. So they've decided to actually move forward in life. I'm not talking about people who haven't come back yet because of uh, concerns. This is not planning to come back at all. So they move forward in life without intimate fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ, without joining together in worship like we enjoyed so much today. My friends, if this describes you, which you're here, so I don't think so, but or somebody you know 
the enemy of the soul, Satan himself, has them exactly where he wants them to be. For thousands of years, he's gotten pretty good at this. His main strategy against the church is divide and conquer, separate them, get them separate, and destroy them one on one. And I believe he's used the cover of COVID-19 to do this in the lives of many believers. If this is true of anyone you know today, hopefully not true of you. Let's pray that God will help them break free, help you break free. Let communion even be a spiritual distress call. Maybe something's come in your life that was not there before. A habit, a sin, and you know you need to call out to God in spiritual distress. And I need to be delivered from this. Let today be the day that you say, let's move forward. Not only our leaders need to be forward, we all need to walk by faith. Amen? Amen. Amen. If we're not doing that already, let's start today. Let's walk together. As we follow that, that lamp of God's word that's before us, I believe that individually, as a church, we'll get where God wants us to be. Yeah. Amen? Why don't you pray with me? Father, as we think about the, the Psalms, we know they are laments. They are great times of grieving, but they usually settle before they finish, before they end, because that's where the hope is. That you will help us to move through the different seasons of life by faith, walking knowing that you'll show us each step we need to take. Father, for each one here, if there's anyone here that has not fully trusted in Christ, that as, even as we distribute the elements, that they'll settle that before you. Or if there's some issue they need to confess to you or acknowledge to you for cleansing, that they would do that. I think this is a time of refreshment and renewal. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. still have the box up there for the benevolent offering. So we have to go back to the second time. But thank you for asking.
night that he was betrayed, as Jesus gathered with his disciples, he had a limited number of people in front of him. But he knew, as the Son of God, that this bread will be multiplied over the centuries. Thousands upon thousands, millions upon millions, would gather at different times to celebrate the Lord's Supper. I believe he even knew that on May 1st, 2022, members of the first people from the First Baptist Church would gather here to get together to remember what Jesus did that night and would do the next day in sacrificing himself. But the bread was to remind us of his perfect life, that he came to earth to step into humanity, fully God, fully man, to show us what God is like. And then that night, I'm just going to ask you to just put your, get your bread with you, just kind of put it up in front of you, just a sense that we all have this together. And he said to his disciples, this is my body which is given for you. Take and eat this and remember me. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son, Lord Jesus Christ, the bread of life, to come, to live on earth, to reveal your glory, to point the way to you, Father. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Help us to not only believe this in our hearts, but to bless others by telling them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
morning, I my devotions, I pray to the blood and the name of Christ that the evil one, Satan, would not interfere with our service today. They would not have an opportunity to grab hold of hearts or interfere. But this is not the blood that I was praying about. It's the blood of the sacrifice. It's the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Through His sacrifice, through His authority, we can pray and call on the Lord to do amazing things. But on the night he was betrayed, he had not shed his blood, but this was looking forward to what he would accomplish, as he said about the blood. And now we look back on what he's been accomplished and remember it. Remember it. So Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, and he said to his disciples and to us, This is the blood of the new covenant shed for you and many for the remission of sins. Take and drink this in remembrance of me. Lord God, sometimes we speak without thinking about what we mean by the blood of Christ. What we mean is the atonement, the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ for us and offering us redemption through faith in Christ alone. The forgiveness of sins, the cleansing, all of that is part of what we do. That that righteousness I talked about implanted in our souls can be lived out in our lives because you are in us through faith. Thank you for the reality of what the communion time is about. Thank you for each one here. I pray that they've been blessed and will now be a blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we we'll have to do something else that we haven't really done before. Is I don't think that we've had the, the worship team coming up at this point. So we all have to leave. We will do that in a second. But let me tell you one more thing. If you like going and looking at movies and seeing little things that happen during the movie, and think, oh, well, there's something, there's something. Go back and watch the tape of this and see the little things that happen. Uh, hopefully it didn't distract you. But because it's trying to get used to what we did before, do a couple little things and go back. We won't have a contest who finds the most little things. But we still have joy in the Lord. And we're going to rejoice together in fellowship. Thank you for being here today. God bless you.